University and also Professor of Communications in the School of Communications at the University of Johannesburg. Tonight, we are talking about something really fascinating and really interesting and, and slightly controversial to some and the absolute future with a lot of hope for, for many, and that is cryptocurrencies. And of course, what are cryptocurrencies and how is cryptocurrencies affecting us in the age of the fourth industrial revolution? Now, these are some of the things that we are going to talk about tonight, including the broader thing about is it a fab or a, is it a fad or is it fab? Fad or fab, sorry, colleagues. <laughs> and with me tonight, I have a fabulous panel. And firstly, we have um, Professor Monica Singer, who is a professor of practice in the School of Accountancy here at the University of South Africa. And she's also the South African lead at Consensus. And she is very interested in particular in issues around blockchain. So we will talk a little bit more uh, about that as well. We also have uh, James Preston lead, um, uh, joining us with the, an astronaut. In the, <laughs> he's brought an astronaut to the, to, to the party. And he is the head of BISCON, or the, 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 um, he is the development uh, head of the uh, business development at Binance Africa. Sorry, I stumbled on that. Head of the business development of Binance Africa. A warm welcome to you, uh, Brent and Neke. It's very lovely to have you with us. And we also have James Preston with us, joining us, as you can say, uh, see from outer space, from the NASA space station tonight, which I think is fascinating. That might, that might say something about the future of cryptocurrencies as well. And he is the project lead uh, for, for global uh, crypto. It's lovely to have you uh, uh, with us as well, um, James. Thank you um, so much. Last but not least, we have a colleague of mine here, Jude, and uh, uh, Usha, who is, sorry, we can't, I can't see you. We, we have you with us though, I hope. Usha, you're with us, yes, sorry. Uh, Usha Okonkwo, who is a senior uh, uh, lecturer in the Institute for Intelligence Systems here at, at UJ, and perfectly poised to talk to cryptocurrencies and everything uh, that surrounds this debate tonight. So a warm welcome to you as, uh, as well. It's lovely to have you with us. So I started off the intro tonight uh, talking about uh, this idea then, uh, cryptocurrencies, fad or, or fab. I think we need to take a step back firstly, maybe, and ask the broader question about what are cryptocurrencies? And I, I'm going to turn actually to you, James, first. As the project lead for Global Crypto, can you explain to our audience what is, what, what is it that we're talking about when we talk about cryptocurrencies? Well, the primary thing is that uh, they're encrypted digital tokens. That's where the name comes from. Crypto is just where the, the, um, it de is derived from the term encryption or cryptography. Um, and uh, it was a very clever invention by a, a person or team named Satoshi Nakamoto, which most people probably would have heard of. But this invention allowed for the transfer of a digital token from one person or, or network to another without there being any form of duplication. So if I have a digital token here, I can send it across to another person and that transaction is secured via very uh, complex cryptographic algorithms. And so all of a sudden you now have, in essence, you have currency, which is in, living in the digital space. Um, and uh, it's decentralized. That's the big thing because yes, in the past, we may have been able to uh, transact using standard Excel spreadsheets, right? Digital spreadsheets, but there had to be a central authority to ensure that those spreadsheets were being very well maintained and examined and audited. But through this encryption and uh, cryptography, these networks can now be decentralized. And so uh, cryptocurrency is a decentralized form of money um, and really is arguably the future of how we transact. Mm. Monica, I'm gonna uh, turn to you as the, the, uh, the sole woman on the, on the, on the uh, panel this evening. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. But from your perspective, when we ask this question about, you know, what cryptocurrencies are, 
and how we explain it to, to the audience in, in, in lay terms. I mean, it used to be that, that money and currencies were coupled up to and controlled by a central bank and, and measured against the gold standard or any other sort of, you know, standard. And, 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 and then, of course, it could be blown out of proportion when, when, when inflation hit and people started printing more money, basically. Are we moving away from that? Is that the, 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 the ways of the past? So let's clarify, the money is not backed by anything. It's just a sentiment. As you know, Nixon took away the backing of the dollar against the gold. So it's all an illusion. And therefore, when people start questioning about cryptocurrencies being an illusion, what's the difference between cryptocurrencies and the illusion by the central bank? So what I'm um, proposing is that if you think about the definition of money, Money is a unit of account, a store of value, or a medium of exchange. So when Satoshi created um, Bitcoin, which for me, it deserves the Nobel Prize for the most incredible creation ever, it felt it was created as a result of huge pain because it was at the time of the financial crisis. So this group of people, or maybe an individual, we don't know, when they saw the crisis, they said, how do we do something completely different because whatever we've done to date is not working and we are living an absolute lie. And we, we were saved by the seat of our pants in terms of the crisis. So when you read the white paper, which for me changed my life, you realize that we have got it all wrong. I'll give you an example. First, we always thought that we needed to centralize, trust the central bank, trust the banks, trust the auditors, trust these intermediaries, they'll come and rescue you. We know that's not the case. Then we, we not only gave this power to all these authorities, remember baby boomers believe in the authority, we actually believe that um, centralization was going to, uh, of records would also be the right way to go. And centralization doesn't work. And also we didn't have the tools, like for example, the internet was very young and we couldn't trust it. We could trust the internet for information, but we couldn't trust the internet for value. So, you know, the concept that you need a different level of consciousness to resolve a problem that was created. So here comes Satoshi and with a different level of consciousness says, guys, we're going to decentralize. We're going to use the internet. We're going to put mathematical formulas so that nobody can cheat. And the most incredible thing that affects the accounting and audit profession is that we are all going to see the ledger at the same time, single version of the truth. Imagine real time audit, real time recording where everybody sees everything at the same time. So it's gonna be very hard to cheat. And on top of that, I'm gonna put this mathematical formula to prevent any of us from colluding. And on top of that, I'm gonna decentralize these ledgers all over the world in the internet so that no hacker will be able to get to 51% of all these ledgers. The same ledger, but now replicated in the internet. And then I'm gonna make this very open source so that all these people around the world will get inspired to change the world and, and improve the Bitcoin ecosystem. So if that's not better, that one central bank that has proven time and time again to devalue the currencies. And I'm originally from Uruguay and South America, and I can tell you what I've seen is horrendous because the money has disappeared because the, the central banks have made banks disappear all, all overnight and people have committed suicide because their money disappears. Mm -hmm. and, and just remember that now you have a currency that can be used by anybody without asking permission, without asking uh, any central authority, you can have your own wallet, you can exchange value with anybody in the world, real time, very low cost. Um, yes, you have to understand a, a little bit of a technology, but I think the user experience will become easier as the time goes by. And you will see that it's gonna be so simple to use this technology. And I can assure you that Mark my words, in the near future, you're going to have a wallet, your own wallet. And this is not me only. Everybody in the world will have their own wallet. And with a little finger, they're going to be able to swap real time. This coin for that coin, you know, no wall gardens, no regulation, no permission, no working hours, no public holidays. 
all under your control, under your desire for um, making money or even gamble, gamble your money. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But that ability to empower people to look after their own finances. You know, in the world, we haven't done that. First, we have left 1.7 billion people out of the economy, the unbanked or underbanked. And on top of that, we created this incredible, crazy idea that women shouldn't know about finance because their husbands are going to look after them. Really? So this is the time that for the first time we can empower everybody with simple technology that enables peer-to-peer, -peer, like James explained. And that for me has got much more credibility than trusting all these intermediaries where we put our trust ever, forever in history. That has to change. Now we must empower people to trust themselves and we must educate everybody to ensure that they achieve financial independence. We come back to that because I think that's a very important question, particularly in the context of an unequal society such as, such as South Africa and many others, of course, throughout the global South and, and, and globally where, 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 where uh, wealth discrepancies are increasing. So we will ask that question in a bit. Is it really so that everyone can have access to this new, dig, these new digital um, uh, uh, currencies? Um, I'm going to turn to you, Brenton. I mean, I imagine as a business developer, you, you would I, I, I agree broadly with the sentiments shared by, 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 by Monica. But what is your take on cryptocurrencies? Absolutely. Um, so by and large, I completely, I mean, you know, uh, the audience is probably looking for um, a little bit of friction, but unfortunately, I completely agree with Monica. Um, you know, one of the, um, I think, problems with people's perspective on this is uh, we've sort of been indoctrinated, like Monica said, into um, just outsourcing that trust and that sovereignty to third parties, right? And within currency, we, we see just like um, we've seen that our current monetary system doesn't work. But mm -hmm. to the average person, it, it, we can't fathom not having an institution there or somebody managing this money. Um, and that is what blockchain and cryptocurrency has largely provided to us. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's any ambiguity in the fact that, um, like Monica explained and like James explained, it was created in, you know, sort of like a phoenix from the ashes of the 2008 financial crisis, mm -hmm. where this group of people, it's not just a matchup of time, they used the headline from um, a current newspaper at the time to explicitly state to us that this system is not working. This is a better way of doing things. Um, we also, yeah. Sorry to interrupt you, and I think that you, you were poised to, to answer this question uh, before we, 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 we start looking at maybe sort of the, 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 the flip side of things. But the, 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 there's a question from the audience. What is the money uh, value based on? Is it, based, is it demand based or is it so that we only have a set amount of cryptocurrencies? Perfect, perfect. So I think what cryptocurrency by and large as a currency does is it returns us to hard money principles. And this brings back something very important that was mentioned in uh, August of 1971, uh, Richard Nixon dropped the gold standard um, for America and then uh, you know, passed through the Bretton Woods Agreement that essentially meant that no currency in the entire world was backed by gold. Um, and in fact, from that stage, it was backed by absolutely nothing. So the, our current vision of currency, and I think that comes down to that financial literacy is that a lot of people don't know that. If you go and ask your aunt or uncle, oh, um, you know, what's the intrinsic value of currency? Oh, it's backed by gold. Um, and we still get that answer today, which is incorrect. Um, so I think you've got to look uh, at that question in the context of what our current monetary system is, where you have, so you've got to ask, what is our current money backed by? So the only reason somebody will take your 10 Rand notes or your 100 Rand notes is because the government has said to everybody living in this land that this blue piece of paper is worth 100 Rand. When someone gives it to you, you will exchange for that 100 Rand worth of goods or services. Mm -hmm. And the issue with that is the centralized party is the one who controls the, um, the supply of this and essentially also demand, right? So in that market, we've got a centralized 
party who's essentially manipulating the value. If we think about value in the way we know it, right? Eco 101, supply and demand. But if you move over to cryptocurrency, let's, and again, I disagree with this largely because I feel there's, there are sort of intellectual backing that backs cryptocurrency and provable cryptography and mathematics. But let's just say both, both are backed by nothing, right? So we can come to this conclusion. Our current monetary system is backed by nothing. Um, mm -hmm. and digital currency is backed by nothing. If we then oppose the two systems, in one, the supply and demand is completely out of your control, controlled by a centralized party. Mm -hmm. But if we look at the cryptocurrency system, Bitcoin, for example, um, the, supply, the supply is determined by open source software. So for example, if you had to ask someone how much US dollars would be in circulation um, on the 5th of August, 2032, it would literally be, uh, the accuracy you'd get from a five-year-old would probably be the same as, um, you know, the accuracy you'd get from a seasoned economist, um, particularly if we look at the since COVID. But the amazing thing about Bitcoin is I can tell you with a very high degree of accuracy exactly how many Bitcoin there will be on August 5th, 2032 at 2 p.m., for example, with a high degree of confidence. And that's because the supply is controlled open source by a software protocol that everyone has access to. We might not all be able to understand it, but we all have access to it. It's completely transparent. Um, so if we look at it in those contexts, our current monetary system is backed by nothing. Crypto, if it is backed by nothing, like we say, at least it has controlled supply. So there's true price discovery that happens there. Um, I, I think that's how I would answer it. It's backed yeah. by the fact that it has scarcity. The supply is limited and it has transparency in the sense that there's not a central party who dictates how the network works, how much Bitcoin is created. Um, I hear you. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. And, and I'm going to, sorry, have... Monica, I'm going to let you come in. Yeah. I just firstly would yeah. like to, to turn to, to Usha, my colleague here at UJ, and I'd, I'd like to, to phrase the question slightly differently. So, so, we, 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 we hear this, but is it, is, it, is it really all that it's made out to be? Is it, is, is it really the future? Is this a credible alternative to more traditional uh, uh, um, currencies? What's your take on that? Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to say, first of all, that I'm not a financial expert. Uh, so what I am is a researcher. And the research, we try as much as possible to talk about technology, not about the application. So I can say that uh, I'm not an expert in crypto, but when you talk about the, the technology on which crypto rights, that is blockchain, then that is where I usually come in. Um, first of all, to know whether we, it is the currency of the future, we need to go backwards. Mm. How did we get here? Okay. Um, there was uh, when I gave a talk at uh, it was at uh, what is called Africa uh, Bitcoin Africa. There was something I mentioned. For instance, all these things started with the natural way of doing business, that is barter trade. The barter system is the natural way of doing business, and in that system, there is little or no cheating there, because it is not about want; it is about needs what you need so you go and take what you need and it is a very very good business a, a very good system in the sense that it promotes productivity because all you do is to make sure you reduce their need so that what you go out to look for will be just few things mm -hmm. now over the time that was okay when the population of the global population was very low but with time there are a lot of people getting born as at uh, probably 100 years ago we have just less than it a billion people. Today we have almost going to 8 billion. So when we look at that movement, at a point, it, it, the natural resources became scarce because there are a lot of people going for them. Mm -hmm. And then what do we need then? N uh, needs turn to want. Yeah. People want to acquire, people want to keep things. They want to keep it for the future. The entire system became uncertain. Mm -hmm. It is that uncertainty that we sat down and people came up with the institutions like the government. And they, we are part of the government because we instituted the government itself. And from there we have financial institutions all you know, associated or backed by the government. 
and the government is us as well. However, uh, the same man is a bundle of possibility and the word miniature. So the possibility about man made those institutions very unreliable and very uncertain. And then here comes a solution that is crypto. Mm. I will say one thing, crypto is not going away. No, it won't go away. Just like there are other ones that are coming. Now, what happened is that the people couldn't, who couldn't trust the system, we know. I'm not talking about the banking institution. I'm talking about the government itself because the government backs them. So if we do not trust this entire system, we're talking about how do we substitute and then here comes uh, blockchain and then crypto on the financial side. So what happened is that the problem, the truth is that we've preferred to trust a machine instead of trusting human. Mm. This is understandable because it is easy to trust your dog than your neighbor, you know that. So when, when we get to that point, now the problem is that that institution, if you look at the crypto uh, uh, platform, you see companies like Amazon, PayPal's, even MasterCard, a whole lot of them supporting it. But the biggest institution is saying no. Mm. Because that is the institution you want to change. Yeah. And they're going to fight. They're very strong. We know they're very strong. So they're not going, they've already brought out their own, the CBDC and the rest. So the issue now is where do we go? What would the future put in? Mm. I think one of the things that uh, is going to happen is that the government is not going anywhere because even if you're changing that institution, financial institution, they're there. So anything you do, but eventually like, the way I look at the future, something has to happen. I remember in 2019, December, I was in a conference in Hawaii. We had a bunch of people were discussing about the possibility of going online to teach and do things online. Nobody in that forum believe we could do that. Three months after, World online. Three months after that discussion, we we're all online, and we probably are com we're all comfortable with it. So when we talk about crypto, one of the greatest problem crypto has now is acceptability. Mm. That is just it. That is why the market. The, it, does, it, it seems when the people who are actually well, the government, that the government, whatever, when people start to accept it, mm. because a lot of people don't. I ask somebody, will, will you buy a crypto, a, a Bitcoin? He said, of course, how much is it? How much is one Bitcoin? I didn't want to call the, I didn't want to tell him it's going to $60,000. I said, it's just about 20,000. He said, for what? Just one? For what? You know, that kind of thing. So, but what I think is that in the future, there are game changers that will come in that will make the idea of going to using cryptocurrency just a normal thing. Mm -hmm. There are game changers that will come because today we're talking about money. Because if you have money, you buy crypto. If you don't have money, what do you do? There are a lot of people who don't have it. So it will get to a time where a whole lot of things will have to come into play. There are things that you can predict. But whether crypto is here to stay, yes, you can, you can move it away. And you can wish it away as well. No, I hear you. I guess there's a lot of consensus amongst you, but amongst the panelists here about it, it actually being the future. I know you wanted to come, come in, Monica, so I'm, I'm going to let you come in. And I think that um, the, 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 the follow-up question that I, I want to, to ask then, so if it is a credible alternative, uh, Monica, how long will it be or how long will it take until we see it being a, uh, the, the usage more widespread? And could we take it offline as well? Okay, first I want to explain something that is fascinating. If you have a look at history, uh, based on what Uche said, the, the, the Spanish um, money became the reserve currency of the world. Why? Because they invented a coin that you could split in, in little pieces. You could divide it in eight. So, and the coin was pure silver. So it was like the most pure, a coin and therefore people li like the functionality. So now we know that money becomes acceptable when the technology that is being used, it's something that it becomes ubiquitous and everybody's using it and it becomes, we don't have to ask permission and it's a, a, a record you can trust. You know, trust exactly what Uche has said. So, mm -hmm. so we know that this is just the beginning of the acceptance 
in countries like, if you um, look and listen to all the lectures I listen to, for example, when they do interviews of people in Argentina, in Venezuela, in Lebanon, this has become the currency, the reserve currency of those people because of the fact that they cannot trust their own uh, currency and that slowly the US dollar is losing its power because they're printing without uh, any, any measures. So we are slowly becoming disillusioned with the fiat currencies issued by the central banks. So in terms of when is it going to happen? You know, this is a, another incredible thing about human beings. We think that everything happens like this, you know, like, like one, two, three. No, this is not happening one, two, three. This is happening one and then two and then four and then eight. It's gonna be totally hyperbole. And the issue is that one day you're going to open the newspaper and think, what the hell? Already, people that I told them five years ago, please buy Bitcoin, and they didn't. And they now say, oh my gosh, no, am I too late? And I go, but I told you it was going to happen. And imagine, you would have invested, I don't know, 100 grand? And they could have such incredible wealth already because it's become a store of value. So what I'm saying to people is that this is happening now. It's, um, and you know, they say the future is now, it's just not evenly distributed, meaning not everybody knows that it's happening now because it's so hyperbole that people cannot begin to comprehend the extent of the use. And, and the main thing that everybody's saying truly mm. is that this is an, it's the technology that is open mm. and that it's, it has this immutable ledger, blah, blah, blah. All of the things that we've been saying is the technology that is going to make it the number one type of uh, currency of choice. But yes, the central banks will come and compete and the banks are going to compete. They're going to issue their own coins. They're called stable coins. And Facebook is going to issue their own coin, another stable coin. So there's going to be many, many coins and people will have choices. So that is the beauty as opposed to you are now stuck with the law that says you will use the red. Why? So, and, so that's, my, that's where the world changes. Yeah. That is my follow-up question. And maybe I should turn to, to you to, first, James. So this, this idea then of the proliferation of, of currencies and what determines the value of one currency versus the other. And we already see there are, there are alternatives to, to, to Bitcoin. We've been talking a lot about Bitcoin, but there are of course other currencies out there. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I think it, it um, follows on from the original question from the audience, which was that how are these cryptocurrencies valued? Where is their value derived from? Um, and the bottom line is they are derived from the market. The market does decide the value. I mean, Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, could all they could be worth $1. Bitcoin could be worth $1. It doesn't change the premise of, of what they are. Um, even, you know, why is one dollar um how much it costs to get a mcdonald's burger right in the states for instance why is that well because 150 200 years ago when they first created the the um the gold standard linked to the us dollar gold purchased a certain amount of goods right and that goes back generations it all is economics is a social science. It all comes down to human social interaction. That's what economics are. And cryptocurrencies are based on economics. So um, for me, that really is what it comes down to. The markets will decide how much these currencies are worth. And, it, and if you look at the way the markets are responding at the moment, I think we're going to see um, widespread human adoption of these currencies. And again, it, 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 what is really important is that this is true free market capitalism because the market can now decide which, currents they, which currency they want to use, one, and two, how much those currencies are really worth. You know? So people could say, is $56,000 for one Bitcoin too much? Is $4,300 for one ETH too much? Mm. Well, uh, if the market's willing to pay that, so be it. That, that, mm. that really is what it comes down to. And, and people can sit and have an opinion all they like about whether this is worth X. But the reality is the numbers don't lie. The people don't lie. And if someone's willing to pay it, we either take advantage of that or um, we, we 
adjust and evolve and adapt according to how society is evolving? So my question then is, how is this? And firstly, is, are these currencies available to everyone? Do, do we all have access? And we know that we have unequal access to the digital world as, as is, and particularly in our, our own context. And that, that might be worrisome to some. So when we say this is the future, what happens to people who then, I mean, we already talked a little bit about trust and trust in banks and so on. And, and a lot of people actually at the distrust in, 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 in a banking system, a monetary system as such is quite low. And people choose to put their hands in a in, 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 in proverbial mattress. So what happens, you know, with cryptocurrencies? This is really this, this easy and do we all have access to this digital world? I don't know if anyone um, 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 want to question or should if you have uh, thoughts on I'm that. I'm happy to comment. I'm working yes. with companies oh. in, in Africa that they are inventing uh, devices that you don't even need to know how to read or write. You'll be able to use it by using your, your finger, uh, biometrics, and it doesn't even require the internet. It gets charged during the night. You can use it during the day. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to be already um, being used in, uh, for taxis so that people don't have to pay in cash. And, and the other thing you have to understand, for, I'll give you one simple example. Uh, Facebook, um, there's 2.3 billion people in the world that use either Facebook, Insta Instagram or WhatsApp, and they are going to launch their own stable coin. And you're going to use your WhatsApp already in Brazil. You can use WhatsApp to pay. So do you understand that you don't need to have any fancy computer, any great knowledge? Everybody in the world, more or less, has a mobile phone nearly, as we know, and everybody knows how to use a WhatsApp message. So what's the difference between sending a message or sending money? Mm. Do, do you understand where we're going with this? The world, the user experience is becoming more and more simple, as we know, let you know, in the same way that, you know, the internet you, you, it was created using TCP IP technology and nobody cares because the main thing is, can you send an email? The same is going to happen with this technology. You're never going to even know you're using this amazing blockchain technology behind it because it's going to be so easy to use. So anyone can use it. Can anyone also then create it? Their own cryptocurrencies. Could I have an ILVA currency, an ILVA coin that I that I put on the market? Yes, absolutely you could. Um, Brenton, Elmer, if I can also just, yeah. Um, so 100%, uh, you know, there's, uh, and I think this comes back to all the different types of currencies. Um, it, it's important to note that um, each currency has distinct properties, distinct use cases, um, and that's also one of the reasons, one, why multiple currencies exist, and two, why each of them have sort of specific value. So, for example, if you look at the Bitcoin network, it can only transact at a certain speed. So if you have, for example, funds that you'd like to utilize in a quick, cheap micro basis, you might then opt, for example, for um, to hold those funds in XRP, whereas... Ethereum, which is the second most popular, um, and I just yesterday, I think it was, um, the market cap just crossed $500 billion, um, I think surpassing Visa and um, JP Morgan, if I'm not mistaken. So that cryptocurrency is really like a decentralized internet, where instead of me creating an app and loading it onto Google or Apple's app store, where they can say, yes, you can do this, no, you can't do this, I'm going to take 40% of all of your payments, I use this Ethereum network and the Ethereum cryptocurrency to host my DAP on the network or my decentralized application. So the use cases are very different for all these different coins and by and large, that will dictate what their value is. So um, you could even hold multiple currencies, for example, for different um, functional purposes. So Bitcoin transacts slow, but is very secure. Maybe that's like my um, pension fund type product, right? So I hold those funds in there. And then maybe I need to buy coffee every morning on my way to work um, or pay for my taxi. And, and that sounds exceptional, by the way, Monica. Um, I could potentially use like XRP, for example, and a little QR code wallet. And then mm -hmm. with an app now, I can transact in under a second or 
um, you know, Binance's USD coin, Binance USD. Um, and just to give you a practical example, it costs about 27 South African cents, 27 South African cents to make a transaction. So even if I send $1 billion, it'll cost me 27 South African cents. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes three seconds to occur. So each of these cryptos sort of um, have their own value propositions. And that's why the demand and supplies and value sort of differ. Mm -hmm. uh, and if, but, well, if I can also just add something onto what Monica said, um, I, I love what she said about, you know, we can have this call right now because of TCP IP, but nobody's probably even heard of that. And that's where you're, we haven't even begun to see the potential of this market. So uh, the internet, for example, before it, it existed, you know, about 20 decades before the browser, I'm sorry, not 20, 20 years, sorry, uh, before the browser, but nobody was really using it. And the, the whole, the Netscape and the browser wars, that really gave people a simple way to access this new technology and use it without thinking about command line interfaces and, um, you know, the underlying protocols. And yeah. that's what we've yet to see those. I like Monica said, one day you'll pick up your phone and before you know it, 2.3 billion people will be using cryptocurrencies seamlessly. And we're just in that phase, in my opinion, at the moment where the user experience is being built out to uh, a degree where, you know, uh, Brenton or Uche or Ilva can just pick up their phone and decide they want to send um, $300 to her son who just got a great engineering job overseas. Um, and you can do it at 11 o'clock in the night in three seconds and it costs you 10 cents. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting, you know, thing to think about and, 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 and the fact then that we could have a, a plethora of, of different currencies, we could all have our own and, 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 and so on. And someone is posting the question online. So how can a currency like Ethereum, for example, be worth more than an organization? Isn't that uh, like saying the dollar is worth more than, than the Nescafe taken together or any big organization you know and i think that this is these are some of the things that are, are, are worth thinking about but i want to change the discussion a little bit so i think it's important to think about this idea of, of whether it's accessible to everyone and how quickly we will move forward into a world where we only trade in in digital currencies for example it's an interesting thing to think about but for now online and the online world. And we know that there are a lot of trappings here. So uh, a lot of people will say, but isn't this just a, a cryptocurrencies uh, kind of feeding uh, online crime being used for, for, for online crime, money laundering, et cetera. What's your, what's your thoughts on that? I don't know, uh, 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 James, and if you have any, any particular thoughts on that, online no. crime and use of cryptocurrencies. You know, it's, it, it's a tough one because I, I understand the regulators. I mean, I've had conversations with uh, bankers, um, you know, even the, the various blockchain R&D departments of certain banks, and they have very valid reasons for why there is so much regulation around preventing money laundering, around preventing um, all kinds of, of financial crime. Um, and so, you know, I understand that governments and states exist to protect the people and protect, protect, protect the citizens. Um, but at the same time, criminals will do whatever they can, right? I mean, whether there's regulation or not, whether there are cryptocurrencies or not, criminals will do and find a way to get their value across the border or in the hands of their operators, etc. Cryptocurrency is just one of the channels uh, right now, that is fairly easy for them to to um, to utilize uh, at the moment, you know. But if there was no cryptocurrency, it would not stop their crime. They would still be doing the crime, and they would just find another channel to transact, right? So just because cryptocurrency is an easy channel for them to transfer value doesn't mean that cryptocurrency is bad, right? Mm -hmm. uh, cash today, gold. Um, uh, commodities, they all are used by criminals, all of them. You know, I mean, we've all heard the stat of a cer certain amount of uh, $20 bills have a percentage trace of cocaine on them, right? Uh, so there really is, um, it's, it's not an argument against cryptocurrencies, in my opinion, because um, 
you know, just because a few bad actors are using it for nefarious reasons doesn't mean that the the use itself um, is, uh, is is a bad one. Mm. Can, so, can I add something? Can yes, I add? yes, please, Margaret, we, mustn't, can we, we mustn't forget that um, uh, the blockchain in the mainnet, it's quite transparent. And that's why many of those people that use Bitcoin for nefarious acts are sitting in jail today. So um, we have a company, for example, Chain Analysis, that they can track exactly where the trades are going. So one of the key concerns that the uh, users have is that it's too transparent. So mm -hmm. I would argue that cash is used more for nefarious reasons than the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem. So um, this is, reminds me of when the internet started that nobody wanted to use it because it was being used for prostitution and gambling and all of these terrible things. And now we can't live without the internet. So, um, it, you know, it's like a knife. You can use it for good or for bad, you know? So it's your choice. So and to use today, what is argument, what, what are really. What are cryptocurrencies being used for? So when we look at it, is it, is it more for, for investment and trading than for actual transaction uh, uh, or over goods or services? I'm gonna answer very quickly and then I'm gonna hand over to Brenton because he'll have a lot to say about this. But for me personally, most of my income is paid in cryptocurrency. Um, you know, our clients and the people that I work with are all paying me in cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I've been paid in cryptocurrency since 2018. That's, uh, that is now three years of me being able to take part in the global economy via cryptocurrencies. And uh, my cryptocurrencies that I use are XRP, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum's US dollar Tether, um, and LTC. I've used those four cryptocurrencies to transact internationally. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one of the most common uses for cryptocurrency at the moment is global trade. And I think that's the big reason. Anyway, that's me. Uh, I hear you. But, but we are, we are, we are far it. from being, you know, uh, uh, our pick and pay grocery shopping or our, our, our uh, you know, rentals or, or you know, that, that's, that, that we, we, that, that's, that's, that's the long way ahead, I guess, still. Well, Binance have a crypto card, right, Brenton? Yes, yes. Yeah, please, Brent, um, come in. And I see there's another question for you on the, on the chat box as well. But yeah, please, um, go ahead. So I think, um, like James said, going, uh, or, or maybe going back a little bit, um, I think, by and large, we have to be honest that a lot of the um, activity that's occurring in the space at the moment is centered around investment and speculative purposes. And, you know, it's a very new market um, but what is interesting, um, and, and this is, you know, verifiable, um, all the public stats point to this, is like Monica said, countries that experience higher degrees of certain monetary problems, whether it be devaluation of currencies, political instability, um, the exact problems or um, small little ecosystems, uh, you know, like your, your Turkey, your Nigerias, for example, if you look at the rates of crypto adoption there, they are far higher than anywhere else in the world. In fact, um, Turkey, Nigeria, South Africa, all sit within the top cryptocurrency um, jurisdictions by Google searches, by adoption. Um, so we see that when you look at more first world countries, a lot of the activity at present is driven around um, investment activity. Although I do think there are a lot of solutions being built in the background at the moment that haven't come to market. But if we look at third world countries, um, and again, I use that term very loosely, particularly ones with currency devaluation, political instability, there you see a completely different story. So um, you actually see people there being paid in cryptocurrencies, storing their wealth in cryptocurrencies, transacting in cryptocurrencies. Um, so I think needs have accelerated the adoption cycle in different places um, to different degrees. Um, but by and large, we're seeing a mixture of activity, both in actual use um, as a currency, as a store of value, and also seeing this, this new asset class emerge, which are cryptocurrencies. And that's really mm -hmm. driving all the investment activity. So tell me, will we, I see, I see sorry, there's a quick question for you here, directly, directly from the audience, directly to you, Brenton. So um, uh, why does Binance remove uh, uh, the South African rand currency to purchase crypto? 
<laughs> so, uh, so just to clarify, you can still use peer-to-peer. -peer. You can still use your credit card or your debit card. Um, you can still use the, Sil the Silvergate channel. It's just that um, the liquidity on those pairs was just uh, a bit low for the time being. So what I can promise you is that it's a temporary situation. So in the near future, <laughs> your, your beloved ZAR pairs and deposit channels, et cetera, will all be returned. That 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 there must be you know for, for this particular um, uh, you know uh, attendee now in the audience that must be a relief. <laughs> so, so. Yes. so we we we've talked about the you know this you know as as the future we we you know you answer the question about you know we we, we sort of we, we see the global trend and that James you talked to that about being in cryptocurrencies and 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 so forth but it seems that there is a there is an agreement here about uh, cryptocurrencies being uh, being the future. And someone is asking online, what about tax considerations here? And as I understand it, you know, this is this is also something where, where, where that, that that falls by the side. But does someone want to answer that question, maybe? Uh, I can come in. You know what? I'm a chartered accountant, so I think it. Um, I, I saw the other day a very good uh, tax opinion. It's it's really it follows the normal tax rules. You know, there's no mystery. Okay, if you trade it, it's a tradable asset. If you if you buy it and you hold it, you haven't made a profit until you sell it. If you swap one currency to the other, you have to pay taxes. So the only way not to pay taxes is to buy it and hold it. And then the day you sell it, you're going to have to pay tax. And then it is treated as an intangible, so you'll have to pay CGT unless. Uh, meaning capital gains tax, unless you trade it on an ongoing basis. And the same applies to, um, to many other uh, financial instruments. So it's really not a mystery and you have to pay taxes, of course, if you're going to trade it. And that, that, that my follow-up question will, uh, to that will be, so will we see, and we talked a little bit about that as we started off as well, the, the, will we see a backlash? Will we see the banks buying cryptocurrencies and selling quickly? Will the banks, big banks, come together and try to shoot down the cryptocurrencies. I can tell you exactly because we're working with banks around the world, what they're doing. First, the central banks are all going to issue their own central bank digital currency. Two, the banks are going to issue their own stable coins. They're going to compete with Facebook and all these other coins. So every, that's what I'm saying, that you're going to have this app, that you're going to have so many other uh, coins that you'll be able to trade. So cryptocurrency exchanges like Binance will be able to have such a lot of fun and, and liquidity of pools of all this. But I, what I would like to be able to ask Brenton, which I love this, can I ask this question? I know I'm not the moderator, but Brenton, I just tell everybody what Binance is doing, which is for me an incredible thing that you guys did. When you allowed uh, shares in Tesla to be bought and sold in your cryptocurrency exchange. Mm -hmm. The reason why I'm asking this is because, as you know, I used to run the Central Securities Depository, which I created and I left it because I knew that it wouldn't last for very long. And I can see that that move that you guys created was the beginning of the end of legacy stock exchanges. Because if you can buy and sell crypt, uh, uh, um, uh, a listed share in your cryptocurrency exchange, which is real time, very low cost, fractionally owned, no need for unit trust anymore. Who wants a unit trust that is so expensive and so um, I'm, I'm sure of the value and the, and the cost involved in this unit trust industry. And now you can go to a cryptocurrency exchange and buy fractionally Tesla shares and many others. Why would anybody go to a legacy stock exchange? So I would love you to talk about that. Thank you. I knew we were going to come to Tesla and Elon Musk at some point during the conversation. Yeah, no, do go ahead, Brenton. Yeah, so absolutely, Monica. I, I, I personally feel that this is, so my, just to give you some context, my background is in traditional finance as well. So um, this is an area I really felt was ripe for disruption. Uh, mm -hmm. And what Binance did was we introduced tokenized equity. So it's still the exact same instrument that you're used to, right? You get um, dividends, you're exposed to capital gains, um, but by tokenizing it and adding it to our cryptocurrency exchange, it now firstly provides anybody anywhere exposure to Tesla. So 
I have um, friends who are in private wealth in South Africa, work for financial services providers. And even if a client wants exposure to certain assets, even Bitcoin, it's very difficult to give it to them. And that, that's just, um, you know, counterintuitive. It's my money, which I should be able to put away once. Um, now, with the cryptocurrency exchange offering tokenized equity, um, me as a student, you know, 20 year old me with 200 Rand in my Binance wallet, I can get exposure to Tesla for just that 200 Rand, you know, not the pro prohibitive cost of an entire share. Mm -hmm. um, the same thing with micro strategy. And when you pair this with the, I think the efficiencies, cryptocurrency exchanges have already brought to the trading infrastructure. So, I mean, if you look at our fee structures, significantly lower than your traditional financial institutions. Mm -hmm. um, your market access. So we trade 24-7, 365. Um, you know, Christmas Day, New Year's, Hanukkah, you can trade whenever you want. And mm -hmm. by providing all of these additional benefits um, to a marketplace that by and large, you know, the younger generations are adopting en masse. I mean, even if you look at the Robin Hoods in the US, I mean, no one is, just has a traditional fund manager anymore and you call him up and you know, so once we, we have this transition or this blending, I mean, uh, of the traditional finance world and the crypto world, I really think in, in five to 10 years, it's just commonplace. You know, every person has an app and they've got a full portfolio there, uh, including, you know, financial assets, crypto assets, um, and it's all managed by themselves, minimal fees, no um, sort of barriers to entry. And even somebody with a thousand rand can now go and set up a sophisticated financial portfolio. I hear you. I mean, it's it's interesting. We 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 we're coming towards the end of the show. We're going to run out of time, and we're just you know getting into very very interesting questions. And there are a lot of questions on the chat around capital gains and and SARS regulations, for example, whether the you know the the Capital Gains Act has been amended. I think we we we, we don't have enough time to go into all of the ideas around policy and regulation, unfortunately. But that's really really interesting. I'm going to come back a little bit to some of the issues around safety I and mean, maybe we uh, in our next um, in our next uh, cloud debate we're actually going to talk about hacking and 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 Ushi, I'm going to turn to you here in terms of the algorithms that 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 underpin these cryptocurrencies what happens then when you hack a cryptocurrency and can you hack a no, cryptocurrency no no you you no really you can't really hack cryptocurrency it, it, we are talking about blockchain you can't really hack blockchain so the idea of hacking blockchain is out of question. The only thing is, you, it's about control, because we know the way the mining of crypto and the other uh, uh, values. Because when we talk about this, we, we talk about the, crypto is just one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. There are a whole lot of application of the blockchain technology. You can't hack it, no, because the way the, the technology is in such a way that you can't. So but that doesn't mean that. It is not possible. Theoretically, you can hack it, but practically, no. Theoretically, in the sense that if you're able to take control of every single miner. But what is actually going to happen is that as the day goes by, a lot of people get involved in this system. The more people come into this network, the more almost impossible for you to hack it. Mm -hmm. So in terms of hacking it, no. The only thing is that if you lose your, your, your wallet or your wallet identities and stuff like that, that is when you have a problem. But if you do not, if you don't lose it, no, you can't practically yeah. hack it. Yeah, so the safety of trading with maybe that's that's a, a different way of, of phrasing it. The safety of trading in cryptocurrencies will be safer than me trading through my through my normal normal bank card online, for example. So I think this is where a small sort of difference comes in um, about what we we're talking about earlier. So the real difference is when we use centralized parties, we outsource the trust to them, right? If anything goes wrong, I phone customer service and um, they verify it's me and they set a new password for me or they recover my assets or I phone the bank and I say, hey, you know what? I made a mistake. I used the wrong number when I was doing an EFT. It's supposed to be an eight instead of a nine and you can reverse that transaction. But with cryptocurrency in general, you now take ownership of um, the admin rights of all of your funds. So there is, you are the customer support, um, you are the sales service. Uh, so 
it's as safe as you make it. And I think it's the same with your, your cryptocurrency trading account and exchange. So there's a lot of um, methods that are, are sort of default for a lot of exchanges, things like two-factor authentication, things mm -hmm. like um, whitelisting IP addresses, whitelisting um, withdrawal addresses. So there's a lot of tools that are available to you that make your, your crypto trading experience almost impenetrable. And then with respect to the cryptocurrency networks themselves, mm -hmm. as long as you handle that information and store it correctly, you're perfectly fine. So as mm -hmm. long as you put the right steps in place, because a lot of the responsibility falls on you, then yes, it is much, much safer. Like a lot of the, the, the of course, the, in the online world where we, where we have to take responsibility for, for, for protecting protecting passwords and, 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 and protecting ourselves and, and, and a lot of privacy issues, of course, as well. Uh, colleagues, we are running out of time. I have a sense that the, it's, we, we, we be wearing on the fab side here rather than the, rather than the fad side. The, the, it's, the, the cryptocurrencies, are, I, I get the sense, are definitely here to stay and, and how widespread they will become or how quickly they will become widespread, I guess, is a different thing. And we, 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 we're talking about the world where we're trading much more the global trading front than maybe, as, as we've said, than paying our rent or uh, swiping a card in a, when we take a local combi taxi, as, as we do in, in, in South Africa, many of us. But um, any, any last words? And I'd, I'd like to, to just a quick comment about what the future holds. How quickly do you think we are going to be seeing widespread trading in cryptocurrencies? James, we'll start with you. Oh, um, it depends how you define widespread trading. I mean, we are now seeing huge um, listed companies in the USA now declare to the SEC that they hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet. Um, uh, you know, uh, cryptocurrency trading volume wise is up, uh, I think at last check, something like 100x since mm -hmm. um, a year ago, uh, and that's global volume. So I think we're going to see pretty much uh, crypto as mainstream within two years. Crypto will be mainstream within two years. Um, and in terms of what the implications are for society in general, that I don't know. I think we are, you know, uh, cryptocurrency was invented because of the financial crisis of 2008. And this is, that started the unraveling of the financial system of the modern era. And I think we're going to see a very interesting unraveling of the social fabric that we have become so used to in the last hundred years, you know? And so we're evolving into a whole new realm um, of society, a whole new era of society. What that looks like, I can't predict. Um, I, I do believe it will be better for society. Um, and uh, in my opinion, cryptocurrency uh, is already here to stay and it is wide, wide, uh, widely adopted as it is. It's a lot of technological sort of determination here in, in this. And, and uh, Monica, uh, uh, just, just very, very quickly, are you in agreement two, two years from now? Um, well, two years from now, it depends who you are, you know, because for James, it's happening now. Do, do you see my mm -hmm. point? So yeah. as I said, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. So some people will wake up earlier, others will wake up later, but eventually, mm -hmm we will all be part of this new technology revolution. You know, my boss that creates a consensus, he says it's going to be, uh, you know, the implosion of, of society. It's going to be the clash of the civilizations between the ones that get it and the ones that don't get it. So my passion is to ensure that everybody gets it. It's not yeah. about leaving people behind because you're not intelligent enough to know how to use it. In the same way that even my grandmother knows how to use Facebook, mm -hmm. eventually everybody will know how to use this. So we mustn't leave anybody behind. No, absolutely. And that's, that's been uh, one of the most important aspects of these cloud debates when we have talked about 
issues to do with the fourth industrial revolution is how do we ensure access for everyone and how do we ensure that we don't leave anyone behind and of course our role as a university and, and at the University of Johannesburg we are we are very conscious of this idea of creating an, an, an equal and, and fairer world for, for us all and that's also why we we are continuing this this discussion and having these cloud debates where we are discussing these issues and trying to explain certain concepts but also sort of sharing ideas around Around, around this this new world that are facing us all, uh, colleagues, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm, I'm sadly uh, that we've run out of time. And Brendan and Nisha, we will we will we will have you back for 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 famous last words as well, or, or famous new 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 words and continuous words, I should say. It's been a pleasure talking to you. It's really interesting, and I think that there's much more to say on the topic of cryptocurrencies. And as you say, they will become more widespread. So we will have reason to come back to this discussion many times over. And um, I hope that I will be able to call upon some of you again when we, when we meet today. Next debate is on the 14th of July, where we're going to talk about hacking. And that's an interesting topic in and of itself. And we talked a little bit about that earlier as well, about safety and security in the online space. So thank you very, very much. As I say, it's been a real pleasure talking to you and to the audience who have been uh, uh, zoning in from from home. It's been it's been great uh, seeing your questions online, and we haven't been able to to go through them all. But I'm hoping that we can come back to this topic again. So a very